I've had a lot of people tell me they don't like beets and I feel the culprit is that they've only ever eaten canned beets or they haven't had beets prepared for them properly. Beets are a very versatile vegetable. You can eat them in a nice warm hearty soup, a nice borscht, or you can have chilled beets in a beet salad with some goat cheese. One of my favorite flavors that comes from a beet is just straight up earthiness. It tastes like you're eating the forest floor. It tastes like soil. It tastes like plants. It tastes like everything earth. It tastes like mother nature. In my mind, it's sort of a representation of mother nature because beets are the gift that keeps on giving. You can eat every part of the beet. Same with mother nature. Mother nature is the gift that keeps on giving to us. When I think about beets, I think about the winter. I think of them as being a hearty root vegetable that we eat through the winter that keeps us warm, that keeps us fed, and keeps us sustained in these colder temperatures. I'm originally born and raised in Seattle. I moved to New York over 10 years ago. The West Coast weather is much different, and even the Pacific Northwest Coast weather is much different than East Coast. Out here, it gets cold as in the winter. I think, I'm, I think I'm the only one in New York City that actually likes the snow and loves snow days. At least that's what people tell me. Arya Stark, up in this b Valor Magulis. Winter fell in New York. Everybody's pissed off. I'm excited. People think I've lost my mind. The amuse-bouche, which is the bite-sized portion for this menu, is, I'm calling it vegan tartare. Not because I'm a vegan, I'm actually the opposite of vegan. I don't know, just looking at this, uh, the fact that it's, you know, minced beets and they're seasoned and then it's on a fried golden beet chip, it reminds me of a lot of a tartare canapé. So that's why I'm calling it vegan tartare. For this dish, I roasted some red beets. Then I finely minced them, mixed them with some balsamic, lemon juice, and salt. And then the golden beet chips, I just sliced those on a mandolin and fried them. We got the gold beets with a different texture than the red beets. So the two beets together, I thought they would complement each other in this way. And then, you know, just like a steak tartare, you'd garnish it with some microgreens. This vegan beet tartare is garnished with a microchard microgreen. Have you ever had a cake pop before? So the idea behind this was kind of sort of a cake pop. I kind of drew on the same carnival sort of techniques that I did in my apples menu for my caramel cheddar covered apple. For this one, I sous vide some baby red beets. I took the red beet and I coated it in balsamic reduction glaze. And then I coated it with crushed pine nuts. The beet itself is very earthy and the balsamic reduction, which is very tangy, and then coated with the pine nuts. The pine nuts are also very earthy. They have that pine kind of herbaceousness, and they also have a crunchy texture. Take a bite into it, and you taste Mother Earth. You taste the forest floor. That's the whole point behind the dish. I just wanted you to feel like you were in the forest with this one. So continuing on this path of this forest floor 
kind of inspiration, this next dish is a scored, seared, royal trumpet mushroom with faux beet caviar. I love the flavor and texture of sturgeon caviar. The flavor of salmon roe is okay, but the texture is amazing. I love those little beads. That's why I like making faux caviars because it's not the same thing, but it's about as close as you'll get to the actual texture of salmon roe. This dish is definitely more about texture than flavor. Um, the last dish, the dish before, I would say I layered the flavors a little bit more. The textures of mushrooms are so interesting because they are a fungi. They have this amazing texture that's just very firm but spongy, very hearty but soft and tender at the same time, and then you have the faux caviar which are like little beads of seasoned beet juice that just explode in your mouth when you eat them. Yeah, so for the beet Negroni, we tried out two different variations. The first one that we did was basically more or less a regular Negroni. It was a beet juice, a little bit of Lille Blanc, and some gin. We stirred that all together. And the texture for that one, ironically, ended up tasting just like water. It was just very smooth, very straight, like literally no flavors. Everything was just so perfectly balanced that you actually couldn't taste anything, which was a little strange. And then for the, so the second one, we decided to add it as a rinse to the glass. So it has a little bit more flavor, a little bit more pop. Going into the grooming salad right territory with this now. Yep. Same ingredients for that one. Then we ended up adding a little bit extra beet juice for a little bit more color. And then we added the lemon peel. For Negroni, like it's usually the components are just Campari, a little bit of vermouth and a little bit of a uh, gin usually equal parts or a little bit more gin than the other two but uh for this one we added beet juice instead and it was a pretty good substitution for campari and vermouth as a whole both for color and then in that little sweet edge that the beet has on it this is good i like this one stranger things i'm just thinking about how earthy a beet tastes compared to soil and the fact that the soil absorbs everything and that beet juice absorbed all the flavors, that's very, very strange. The second cocktail was the uh, sugared beet gimlet, basically another variation on the classic cocktail, the gimlet, which you usually use uh, gin or vodka, lime juice, and a little bit of simple syrup. You shake that together, pretty straightforward cocktail. But for this one, we substituted beet syrup for standard syrup. Uh, the color of that one became a nice pink from the beet syrup and the lime juice mixing together. We originally garnished it with a lemon peel and we tried to have it like cut sort of like, you know, draped on the side, but as with drinks, as that usually goes, your garnish when you try to do it first, it usually falls flat. <laughs> so <laughs> it slipped all the way into the glass and we had to kind of like do surgery to get it out. <laughs> it was a very, very time consuming process, but we got it. And the drink looks better for it. <laughs> but we got the shot. <laughs> he got the shot. Oh, that's nice. That is, yeah, that's just, yeah, that's just good right there. For this one, I wanted you to use the chinar because yes. I had bought that for something and then it just kind of sat for a while. unused. Yeah. It's your favorite Amaro. <laughs> of course. So tell yeah, us about that's what that. I said. Tell us about how much you love it. I hate chinar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of chinar by itself because it's just very, a very, very strange decor because it's like, it has a very, like, it's made with artichokes. So already from that, your eyebrows are kind of like, but <laughs> it's definitely like an acquired taste. Like you cannot enjoy it until you've had it a certain amount of times. Uh, yeah. So the thing about making a Bloody Mary first and foremost is that most people don't tend to necessarily realize and they are actually a lot harder to make than you think. 
you're not only trying to get the color right, you're trying to get the taste right. The challenge with Chinar was to make sure that it complemented all the other ingredients within the cocktail without anything overwhelming it. So we subbed out a lot of the main ingredients for this particular Bloody Mary. So I've just been calling it more or less an offbeat Bloody Mary, which makes sense because it has beets in it. <laughs> you normally... Oh, that's cute. I love how you use that. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm stupid. Anyway, <laughs> now I get it. You can be here all day talking about what the proper Bloody Mary is, but use usually some sort of mix combined with vodka, like tomatoes, like a puree or like chilies, maybe a little bit of lime juice or olive juice for taste and so on and so forth. We didn't have any of that for this one. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so we had to completely work it from the ground up. We had none of that, we had chinar. Yeah, so <laughs> chinar was the main ingredient because I was told by a dear friend to get this chinar to work. And so I did my best. So for this one, gin, a little bit of chinar, a little bit of uh, lime juice, a little bit of uh, beet juice, and we add a little bit of chili oil for like that extra spicy kick. It came out beautiful, honestly. Like it really came out, like I really love the color on it. The Bloody Mary is a very heavy drink. A lot of texture once you're drinking it. Um, this one is just, had all the colors and like you know the taste but it was just actually also very smooth we also garnished it with a salmon roe and pea shoots which uh it just it was a very pretty drink honestly i enjoyed the challenge and i liked the fact that something really really good came out of it we tried it out originally in a highball glass and uh it didn't pan out <laughs> because it, we poured it and it came up a little too short When I think about beets and I think about soup, borscht always comes to mind. It's one of the most popular beet soups. Beets, borscht, very classic. I wanted to do something slightly different, so I made a gold beet borscht. Going along with this mushroom and beet combination, carried that through from the last dish to this soup with the addition of morel dashi, layered in with the beet juice and the beets, as well as some lemon juice. I'm calling this one 24 karat soup because it's gold beets. It's gold soup. It's 24 karat gold soup. 24 karat magic. Nah, just soup. You can wear your white Montclair to eat this soup because it doesn't have any red beets in it, which have a higher tendency to stain. Polenta cake with beet greens. I wanted to do a dish to feature just the greens of the beet plant. That's a lot of times those just get discarded, but you can actually eat them, saute them just like you would kale or chard. They're very, very closely related to chard. Although they were carefully placed, it does look like a mess on the plate. I'm aware of that. It's not one of my typical plating. I plated it rustic because all I can hear in my mind is just grits and greens. It's just grits and greens. So with the greens, I just blanched them in some salted water and sauteed them with some crispy garlic, a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of balsamic, served that with some micro chard. And then the polenta cake, I made a batch of polenta. I added in a lot of cheese and butter, a little bit of cream. I wanted it to be really, really rich because the greens are very hearty. They're very earthy and they're a little bit bitter. So I wanted the cheesy, creamy polenta cake to kind of balance that out. Since I used the stems or the beet greens in the last dish, 
I also wanted to use the beet juice again for something. I did a beet cavatelli, I'm sure you've seen it before, but you use the beet juice, which gives it the nice color and the earthy flavor. Semolina dough is an eggless pasta, so zero zero flour, semolina flour, and liquid. I seasoned some ricotta. I wanted to include some fresh ricotta in this because it's super creamy. I knew the pasta was going to be very earthy. Put that on the plate and then I cooked the cavatelli pasta in some salted water, tossed that with some butter and some lemon juice. Very simple pasta dish. Cavatelli and some ricotta. Last but not least, I wanted to make a beet chocolate truffle. I knew the earthiness of the beets would pair really well with the bitter nature of the chocolate. I don't typically use canned beets for anything, but in making desserts, they're easy to blend and there's gonna be a lot of other flavors mixed into this, so it's not just going to be the beets and it's okay if they're a little bit more on the sugary side. I melted some dark chocolate chips and then I mixed the beet puree into the chocolate chips and I also added some cocoa nibs, cacao nibs. We eat chocolate bars and chocolate flavored stuff all the time, but when you actually try the nibs where the chocolate actually comes from, the flavors taste like the rainforest or the jungle. I taste banana, I taste pineapple, I taste all these tropical fruits. You have the beet puree, which the beets are kind of like an evergreen forest, and then you fold in the cocoa nibs those are like a nice little crunch and they're kind of like a jungle or a rainforest earthiness. So it's like two forests in one. They were a tiny bit softer because you do have the beet puree in there. Really nice little chocolate truffle. I'm Shabumi Jones. Thank you so much for being a guest at my dinner party. And don't forget to subscribe. That helps me out a lot. I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm actually the opposite. I'm more of a carnivore. Some of my dishes consist of just meat, you know, like sous vide lobster and ocetra caviar. It's literally, it's two things and it's just meat. I just kind of followed this thought process. I let the, the beat lead me where it wanted me to go. And I just followed that. And I just kind of followed where this menu took me. And if it's gonna take me to a lot of vegan dishes and vegetarian dishes, that's where it's gonna take me. Even though I'm a carnivore, I'm gonna embrace that because the food, I, I want the food to talk to me. I want the food to communicate with me. Cheers. Don't be a stranger now. I wanna see you again. And okay, yeah, so for the, the next cocktail was the, uh, shit, sorry, sweet and beef. Sugared beet gimlet. Okay, sugared beet gimlet, okay.